Well, let's start here because I saw that Ken had a press conference just first time in a while. He's done that, yeah, right? Yeah. To kind of outlaw or outline the vision of, of the season and where it's all going. We know that payroll disparity in baseball seems to be just a runaway train, if you will. Uh, paint a picture for baseball fans what this year hopefully will look like. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, first off, I'm really excited and, and I'll never come out, as you know, and, and give my projection or expectations. I don't do that, but I, I, I'm really excited about this team. Over 30 years in the game, and there's some seasons where I'm more excited than others. Mm-hmm. This is one of those. And and it's finally a normal spring. You know, we, we both addressed the team yesterday, and we haven't done that in a while either because, you know, you had two years of the pandemic, which was ridiculous, and then we had the lockout, which was ridiculous. You know, here we are now with a with a full spring and with fans feeling good. And I, I'm just telling you, from the, the responses and the notes that I'm getting from our fans, and yesterday was packed out there at Salt River Fields, there is a lot of hope for this team. And people are excited about the youth, the athleticism, and the way we finished last year. Yeah, and at the heart of that excitement, um, you know, it, it's been pretty rare in Diamondbacks history to have a prospect as highly touted as Corbin Carroll. Yeah. A lot of people picking him for the National League Rookie of the Year. I know that there's reports of maybe some some talks of a, of a long-term uh, contract already being worked out with Corbin, but just can you talk about how important he is to, to this whole movement? He, well, he really is, and, and when you talk to the kid, you see why he's just so impressive. He's so mature, and and people you know who play with him and just say, "Wait till you watch this guy." He's got so many different aspects of his game that are that are positives, whether it's his speed or his defense or his arm. I mean, he really is you know like that five tool player, and we saw flashes of it last year in less than fifty games. But he is important because he's going to be a fixture in our outfield for many years to come, and I. I would also say the other kids too. Look, I, I did not want to want to part from from Varsho. You know, mm-hmm. I was a huge Varsho fan, and, mm-hmm. and this kid had tremendous power, and he fit too. We just had an abundance of outfielders there with the depth, and when you have the surplus, you can you can make moves, and they were in high demand, all of them. Yes. Uh, but you know, and in fact, I told our we have a really nice security guard during games down in our wow lobby, and and Bill asked me before the end of the season, he's like, I want to buy a jersey, and I want to be able to wear it for many years. <laughs> you know, who do I put on it without you trading? I said, do Varsho. You're okay. Oh, he no. Up, yeah, he came up to me oh, first no. day of spring oh, yesterday and oh, went, oh. thanks, I've got yeah. that Varsho dry. I said, yeah. I'll buy you a new one. You're but doing no, a refund on that, dude. Yeah. I know you. <laughs> right. But nonetheless, you know, there, there's a lot of important pieces. I mean, people put pressure on our uh, top of our rotation and Zach Gallen, who's such a standout pitcher, or Cattell Marte bouncing back, you know, Rojas. It's uh, Walker, the year that he had. I, I'm really excited about our lineup, and I'm excited about the depth we've created. We had huge problems in the bullpen last year, and credit to our baseball operations staff. They brought in a lot of arms there's going to be great competition this spring you brought in this kid who played in seattle once a rookie of the year in in kyle lewis that's quite a lottery ticket here you traded for the top rated catcher out of the toronto system you 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 still have top rated prospects um for this year to go the way you want it to, how many of the, how much of that potential has to be realized? Where are we in that building stage? Yeah, really good question, Beck. And 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 the fact that we traded for Moreno, who you know was number one, number two uh, type uh, prospect in all of baseball, we now have four in the top fifteen. We've never been in that kind of position uh-huh. before. So for us to do what we said we were going to do a couple of years ago and really commit to the minor leagues and and draft the right players, develop those players, hopefully sign them and control them through you know arbitration and maybe even some free agent years. It's important now that they step up. And then we, we balance that by bringing in some veterans. And when we can make, hopefully, a splash uh, free agent move, we would do it. But we'll continue to get creative through trades. Uh, I have a lot of confidence in those guys that are making the decisions. And, and by the way, players want to play here. I mean, when you look at first day of spring yesterday and you're wondering, okay, how are they all going to get their physicals in? No, they did those like two or three weeks ago. They've been here you know, for, for yeah. a couple of months because we built this hitting and pitching lab. And when you go in there a week or two ago and it's packed, um, you know, and everyone wants to be here. They like to play. They like to have a home where they have spring training and their regular season. Um, and whether it's a young kid that's now buying a home here, like most of them are, because they want to be here a long time, or it's a veteran like a Longoria who already had a home here and who's happy to play here. It's been a nice mix of both the young and, and the experienced. Derek Hall, president and CEO of the Diamondbacks, our guest here on Newsmakers Week. Uh, we t- touched on the, the payroll discrepancy. That was a big topic of discussion yes. yesterday, but also long-term and, and looking at stadium possibilities. I know that was a big subject. Is it fair to say at this point, 
uh, with the lease being up in 2027, that everything's on the table in terms of possibilities for a future home for the Diamondbacks? Very fair to say. Yeah, you know, Vinny, it's um, it's a tough situation, and, and there's a lot of moving parts. I think all things equal, you know, being downtown makes makes a lot of mm-hmm. sense. We love being downtown with the Suns. We love the fact that uh, there's so much activity now, um, you know, downtown, that many people are moving down there, that we have, uh, you know, of course, residential. We have apartments. There's excitement downtown. But uh, I think if you... If if you had it, your choice, you, of course you would love a new ballpark, right? But where does that happen? Where, who's the right partner for that to happen in Maricopa County? The, the, the whole point is we need to increase, and it's on me and it's on our business staff, we need to increase our revenues because the more we can increase our revenues, the model is it goes right back into the payroll or into mm-hmm. the experience that our fans are going to have at the ballpark. So obviously, you look at these new ballparks and you look at their mixed use. Can we do that downtown? Probably as well. Um, but you have to have more than just a standalone ballpark today. You have to have the hotel hotel, the restaurants, the activation, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, retail, restaurant, 350 days a year. So we're just kicking the tires to see where that can happen best for us. Um, And and, but I can tell you, whatever it is, it's going to be a great experience for the fans. And it's here in Maricopa County. Now, you you know, these stories, because these stories go in one direction. They're not good. They get in the political realm and all sorts of stuff happens. What what kind of timeline are we talking about here? Because if your guys are in a position where that cable on that roof, you can't operate it. Yeah. If there's no fans, that's not that's not good. I I know it's not. I'm not a smart guy, but I know that's not good. <laughs> it's not a good thing, right? Yeah. It, well, it's hard to believe we're, we're the fourth oldest stadium in the league. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's crazy. And I couldn't right? believe that. Yeah, fact we're either. 25 years old and sitting out in the desert sun, right? So things are going to happen. Um, we identified years ago, you know, nearly $500 million worth of needs. At the time, it was like 280, and now it's it's grown, obviously. Um, and, and we have an ownership group who's willing to put in f- hundreds of millions of dollars into Chase Field. But, you know, it's when do we do those repairs? How would you, how would you schedule that over a three- or four-year period? period because you do have obviously your your regular season schedule you hope you have postseason you have off-season events and concerts uh-huh. um, but for us at least Bic we can still open and close the roof we just have good. to plan it when there aren't fans in the stands <laughs> right right so that's um, not good oh no, yeah at, at least it does open and close we All don't right. want that thing to be stuck in an open position in the middle of the summer <laughs> because those will not be fun games but it might be home field advantage yeah <laughs> I actually think uh, about the timing uh, of of bank one ballpark Chase Field and when it opened in terms of the big picture in in, in the in the baseball calendar, if you will. Yeah. It was right before the curve of these really intimate ballparks, the mixed use ballparks and, and facilities that you talk about. Had the Diamondbacks started in 2000, two years later, it, it, it might have been a different story. Do you agree? Totally. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, at the time, we were convinced by the Rockies that we should go bigger, right? And you should go 50,000 yes. because look what they did with the rock pile. And today, you're designing ballparks that are anywhere from 34 to 38,000, which is the right number, you know, and it's small and it's intimate and it's loud. And it's it, it, that truly is a home field advantage where people come into our ballpark and they say, you know, I, I love Chase Field. I got great memories, but boy, it looks just really big or it looks like an airport or an airplane hangar. So yeah, I think it would look much different today. Um, but but there's ways for us to fix it and make it look much more modernized. There's times we always talk about, should we reduce capacity? Then there's other times like opening day or when you're in the playoffs or when you have a concert and you say, thank goodness we didn't reduce capacity because yeah. look at this place. It's full at mm-hmm. 50,000. So that you know that's always a coin flip. All right, now Derek's been kind enough to stick around a second segment. I don't know if you know that, but your guy gave us clearance on I that. I saw you so, guys both holding yeah. up too. Right, and I figured, exactly. Okay, right. Second, it's like second quarter, Derek. Derek, second <laughs> quarter's coming up, man. Work, Derek. <laughs> All right, before we do that, though, let's close the book on the stadium discussion by saying this, because y- you know my thoughts on this. If Are there really ways to retrofit this thing to make, to create that ambiance? And if so, what, what are the ways to do that? I think so. I don't think you're ever going to get away from that cavernous feel. You know, right. it's, it's never going to feel as intimate as you want it to. But I think we can bring it up to, up to speed, up to code when it comes to premium locations. We just don't have them, right? We don't have the clubs that newer ballparks have. We don't have those... Four tops, or or the you know the the private feeling sections in the seats. We can we can create all of that. We can redo the concourses. We can we can bring that stadium to a modern feel um, if if we're indeed going to stay there and make it look more modern, make it look more new. But as far as making it feel a little closer, you know, to one another and smaller and that huge upper level, I'm not sure we're ever going to be really ever really uh, able to address that. But I think fans are okay. They they've got great memories there. They love it, and we hear that from fans too. I hope it works out. I hope you can stay at Chase because. My family has grown up there. I, I'm proud of that. Well, and like you said, downtown is, is such a cool. It's great well to be right in the center of it. 
Yeah, we continue to talk Diamondbacks with Derek Hall, president and CEO of the Arizona Diamondbacks, who has uh, been kind enough to stick around for a second segment. And we've talked about the, you know, the team, the prospects, the stadium possibilities. All the fun salaries, stuff. Salaries, all the fun stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but let's go, let's zoom out to, to Major League Baseball with, with major changes to the game coming this year. And for baseball fans, it might be casual, a little bit casual about it. And, you, and you're going to see these changes. It's yeah. going to look a little bit different. It's going to feel a little bit different. I mean... As we uh, are on the precipice of a new season, how are you feeling about these widespread changes? I, I like the changes. You know, they were all tested out in the minor leagues. A lot of our players already dealt with these changes when they were down in the minor leagues, and they, they proved to work and to shorten the game. I mean, there were years ago, I can remember being a fan of the game, and they the games were two and a half hours. You know, I mean, there's no excuse for a game to be three and a half hours or closing in on four hours. That's not right. We're asking fans to watch or come in every single game, and, you know, that's tough. When you have competition, you have school, you, you you know, especially Saturday night games followed by Sunday midday game. So I, I like these these changes, and I think the fact that you're going to make the the players a little bit more accountable too, and they're a part of it, right? Because now you do have the the timer, and your that clock is it's real. You only have so many times you can step off the rubber, so many times you can disengage, so many times to throw over uh, before it is an automatic stolen base. The bases are bigger. I don't mind that. And then the biggest change, uh, because by the way, these rules vents I think are really good for teams. Like us, you know, when you're an athletic and speedy team, mm -hmm. having a, a shorter span from first base to second base or second to third mm -hmm. is certainly going to help our team, I would think. Um, and and in addition to that, the one change that people really aren't focused on is a balanced schedule, and that that helps us because now we're going to have more of those popular teams coming in here more frequently. To have the Red Sox come in for a weekend this year in May is fantastic. Yeah. You know, and then we'll have the Yankees every other year. So though you know you you be careful what you wish for. You're not going to play the Dodgers. You're not going to play the, the Padres, the Giants as much as you normally would. Well, now you're going to be playing the Yankees every year. You're going to yeah. be playing, you know, the, the, the Rays every year, the, the Guardians. So it does still get tough. And, and by the way, schedule, and I'm, I know I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going into a rabbit hole, but if you look at our schedule, that first month, wow. I mean, we open up at L.A., then we go to San Diego, then we come back and we have L.A., you know, and then we have Milwaukee, and then we hit the road and we go to the Cardinals, then we come back and we have San Diego again, you know, it's and Milwaukee is in yeah. the middle of that. It's a, it's a tough schedule that first month, so um, we've got to get out to a good start, and as long as we can play like we did last year at the end of last year, where we, we not only competed with those other teams, we beat those teams, mm -hmm. and at the recent owner me owners meetings that we had about a week and a half ago in Palm Beach, it was so cool to have so many different owners walk up to me and so many of my counterparts presidents come up to me and go man we hated playing you guys you know we do not like playing you guys and at the end of the year we didn't want to see you that's good i want to be that team we want to be quiet about it but i want to be that team that nobody likes to play yeah yeah hey listen and i i've said this repeatedly i i'm really hoping that some of these rules changes in baseball kind of kind of engages me spiritually the way baseball used to it. Yeah, and that, that's I've heard my, you say that. Well, yeah. and, and that's kind of my hope here. So my, so I'm wondering now if there's going to be accountability on the players to stay engaged and to play fast. Um, there, we know there's some resentment already to this idea. Will teams that are prepared to do that fare better? What's this going to look like? Um, competitively? It's a really good question. And I think right now um, in your PFPs and all your drills going on on the backfields, I would guess that 29 other teams like us are really focused on these new rules changes. I mean, we watched yesterday batting practice going on live BP with a, with a clock. You know, so the pitchers were out there watching the clock and having to having to start their their, their delivery before. So um, it's it's been good to see our guys prepare. I think so. I think if you're better prepared, obviously you're going to have a better chance. But um, again, a number of our players feel like they they're already well acquainted with it because they did so in the minor leagues and have come up here. You do have some some resistance and opposition, and I, over time it'll all be fine as long as it's good for the game and more importantly, not just good for the game, not good for the time of the game. Good for the fans, right? Yeah. Anything that we do should be yeah. good for the fans, fans like you. The elimination of the shift is going to oh, be yes. a, a transition for a lot of teams, a lot of managers, a lot of strategy changes. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the effects of that will be? Oh, I think it's that? good. I think you're going to see uh, on base go up. You're going to see batting averages yes. go up. And again, teams like ours that like to put the ball on the ground, I mean, these kids know how to make contact. It's only going to help us. I can't tell you, for the last couple of years, you know, part of baseball that I loved was being able to hit it back up the box, right? Back up the middle. And how many times that turned into a, a six three or a four three? Like what? That's a base hit, yeah. you know. So now we're yeah. going to see that. Right. We're going to see that yeah. come back, and you're going to see guys hitting the other way now. Not trying to break a shift, but just making contact and and put the ball in play, and good things can happen. 
Now, I, I don't know if you saw this, but but Vinny loves this. There's a uh, um, a Twitter account, a social media platform on this day in Arizona history. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday was the uh, anniversary of your eight-year contract extension oh boy. that you signed in 2008. Josh Burns got one of those. He lasted two years. Yeah. Well, You're got, still here. Yeah, I got one uh, the first time with Josh Burns. We both right. did at the same time. Right. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I've been, this is my 19th season Wow. with the Diamondbacks. And, uh, you know, like I said, 31 seasons, I think, now in baseball. But it's been it's been awesome. I mean, I love this this place. I love watching our, our revenues grow so that we can continue to put it into our payroll. I, I love our baseball staff now. You know, I, I've always had a good relationship with our baseball staff. And I think back on the way in, uh, we were talking about, you know, in all time, you'll talk about KT. I mean, you guys yeah. remember Towers? Oh, Kevin of course. was so great, right? Such a good guy and lovable, laughable. But this, didn't you once get a midnight call from Amsterdam I from did. KT? I did. He's outside <laughs> in the, the pouring rain. He's it's, the best. It's like it's like four in the morning, yeah. and, and he says to me, "Hey, I think we should Jason Kubel." <laughs> Kubel? <laughs> Where did this come from? And I'm asleep. Where did Where it come you? from? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So, I, so I, this is a roundabout way to say, okay, you've been here forever. <laughs> so, you, you've seen this team try some things. Yeah. Do you think you finally found the right formula? I, I do. I think we found the formula to compete, and this is who we are. This is who we should be, right? That's not to say that we're not going to have those splashes or big free agent signings, but for us to really compete, and you look at the teams that do it, whether it's been Minnesota in recent years or Tampa or, you know, Oakland always does it, the Guardians do it. These are the teams that do it right because they, they do well in the draft. They commit to their development. When we first hired Mike Hayes and we said fix our minor league system first, that's priority number one. We were a bottom five. In fact, some people had us ranked last, 30th in all of baseball. Now we're a top five farm system. That That's really what does it. You have depth, you have a pipeline, you can continue to you know bring up players when, when others move on, and then you have those signings and you have those trades that, that supplement it. I, I do think it works. Now, is it is it fun, you know, having a payroll anywhere from, you know, 120 to 140, having to compete with payrolls that are 200 and 250? No, it's not, but you can't worry about their payrolls. You just have to watch what you're doing, continue to stay consistent, and be disciplined with it, and it will pay off. And I know we can compete. I believe more in culture. I believe more in preparation, teamwork, and I and I like our, our manager and coaching staff because they're also on that same page. Derek Hall, our guest in studio for Newsmakers Week 2023. On the broadcasting front, obviously there's some uncertainty with Diamond Sports, who owns the Bally Sports Regional All right, it's been a great interview. I'll see you guys. (laughs) I was waiting for him to drop that (laughs) question. Thanks. Derek, at this point, what can you... So much for growing revenues. (laughs) (laughs) But what can you tell fans that are a little little wary of whether or not they're... Or where they're going to be able to watch Diamondbacks baseball? They they will definitely be able to watch it. You know, the beauty uh, was the commissioner coming out about a week ago from his press conference here, media conference Mm -hmm. here in Arizona, and he said, these games will be televised. If if uh, Diamond goes away, and hopefully they don't, Bally Sports hopefully is still up and running, um, and people are used to seeing us on Bally. If not, baseball has said they would come in for those 14 teams, or 18, if you even look at others that are in a similar position, they would produce the games and make sure they're on. My guess is, from what I heard, it would be on MLB Network. So people will still have a chance to watch these games, and of course, you can always listen to our flagship right here. Yeah, Right yeah. here. Well, well done, done. Yes. Lead me into my last okay. question. Uh, the announcement yesterday that uh, this will be the final year for the governor. Yeah, it's sad. I mean, Greg, Greg Schulte. Schulte is a, yeah, he's a fixture in our building. He's been here since day one. Uh, he's our only broadcaster that's been here since day one. Greg is, um, he's Arizona baseball and and I love hearing his voice. We have so many fans that in the stands will, will listen to Arizona sports so that they can hear Greg each and every night. Um, I've told him for years, he is, he, not only does he belong, he will be in the broadcast wing of the Hall of Fame and I hope it happens very soon so, so he can enjoy it because he deserves it and he's the uh, epitome of longevity professionalism and entertainment and fans get an opportunity to celebrate him one last season one last yeah. season with the governor yeah. yeah derek thanks so much for thank coming you, in man. spending appreciate some extra it. time with us we Vince, appreciate it thank you thanks for having us yes uh, and best of luck this season i'm thank sure you. we'll appreciate be talking it. to you again oh yeah every soon. week yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right